Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, so I'm Dr. Selik from South Dakota Mines. Uh, so we are very excited uh, to have you for the session for today. Uh, I think we are doing this state and pet agencies for the first time uh, in our history. And today we have four panelists, Dr. Mohsen Behbahani, uh, Anne Nikononis, Teresa Kirschley, and Anilia Brandt. So we'll quickly start with the question. Uh, so I would like... Uh, starting from Dr. Behbehani, uh, please introduce yourself and br briefly describe your job, and then we'll continue. Oh. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohsen Behbehani, and I am a project manager and a hazardous substances engineer with California Department of Toxic Substances Control, a department with Cali PA. Uh, I've been with DTSC uh, a little over a year. And before joining DTSC, I was working for a few years in consulting firms. Uh, my uh, And before that, I was uh, a graduate student at the University of Toledo. And happy to hear. Um, and please continue. Yeah. All right. So uh, my... Uh, Briefly saying, my current role is uh, I'm with the cleanup program of DTSC. Our job is to uh, provide oversight for uh, the contaminated sites in the state of California through either voluntary agreement with responsible parties or through an order, which is issued by the department. As a project manager, my daily routine work is to uh, communicate with responsible parties uh, to keep track of their progress toward uh, our agreed goal, which is uh, the, the final goal, which is actually the uh, complete remedial activity in that contaminated site to a level that is protective, uh, protective for protective for people, uh, health, and also it's protective for the environment. We have, uh, beside me, I, we have in our department, we have multiple other units that provide support for project managers. We have Office of uh, Geological Services, which they provide uh, us with any information. I Maybe mean, most, most of the time through, our, through this procedure, we will get reports, we will have some core documents that are, for example, one, for example, remedial investigation documents or uh, remedial action documents. Those documents have technical details that, obviously, as a project manager, I may not know everything. So, uh, like I said, we have a technical support team that provide comments on those reports, and then we work with our responsible party to get to get them to the place that we think that they are good to go to be i mean good to be implemented we also have a, a toxicology unit a human and ecological risk office that help us to evaluate the risk that any contamination at that site may pose to uh to the people even, even in residential scenario in commercial scenario or in, also some people are working uh, to actually evaluate the risk that it might have to the uh, ecology. And we also have a, an engineering a special services unit that provide us with the engineering, uh, provide us engineering support for, uh, like if we, if we have a system design, we ask them to evaluate if that design is appropriate, if it will help us to uh, get the fight, get our final goal. And also we have, we ask them to review the progress reports to make sure that Mm, the system is operating as it is actually its intention was in the beginning. Okay, sounds good. So let's continue with the introductions. Uh, Dr. Ann Michelonis, please continue. Uh, so please introduce yourself and briefly describe your job. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, I am a research environmental engineer at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and I work in the Office of Research and Development. And specifically, I work um, in a division called the Homeland Security and Materials Management Division. 
And that means that all of our research is being used um, for resilience and emergency response planning. So I specifically um, work on stormwater modeling and field research studies, and in addition, disinfection research, such as um, disinfection of PPE um, by viruses. I've been with the agency since 2015, and I started as a postdoc, and then um, after one year, applied to be a permanent PI in my group. Thank you. Um, Dr. Teresa Kirschling, please continue. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. It's wonderful to meet you. I am Teresa Kirschling, and I am the USGS Deputy Associate Director for Energy and Mineral Resources. Um, so I am at the US Geological Survey, and my role is to oversee USGS science and programming that's related to the full life cycle of energy and mineral resources. So our scientists conduct research and assessment. Um, they help us understand where energy and mineral resources are located based on things like understanding how those resources form. Um, we also track mineral supply chains. We understand multiple uses of the subsurface like geothermal and carbon sequestration. Um, and we look at, at the end of the life cycle, so recycling, uh, recovery from mine wastes. Um, and so in my role, I ensure that our science meets congressional and administration directives, and I communicate our science daily to a whole wide range of different stakeholders. Um, so it is part science management and part people management. Um, I came to the federal government um, through a postdoc program, <coughs> the National Research Council program, um, following my PhD, and I actually um, took a position at NIST, a two-year um, two-year appointment that was largely funded following the recession through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, and then following that appointment, I made the leap into laboratory management at the USGS, um, and I took a job at the National Water Quality Lab. Um, a few years into that, um, there came an opportunity in energy and mineral resources where they were looking for someone to develop and implement a quality management system for, um, for our largely research laboratories. So, so that combination of our research background and also understanding structured quality management systems um, came in handy and was a really nice fit for that role. And then during the pandemic, um, we, we tried to take advantage of, of opportunities that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And so I took a detail into this role um, during the pandemic. Um, and a detail is essentially a, a temporary um, position that gives you the opportunity to, um, to try to, to do a different job for a period of time. Um, and it, it's really a great opportunity once you're within the federal government for expanding your skill set. Um, so I took a took that. Um, and then I uh, applied for this position and made it permanent in April. Thank you. Um, Dr. Anilio Brandt. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So my name is Aniela Brandt, and I am a program supervisor with the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, which is another state department within the California EPA. And I'm specifically a supervisor with our AIR program, and this program is tasked with preventing pesticide-related air pollution in the state of California. And this program is really a mix of monitoring for pesticides in ambient air, modeling and mitigation to reduce potential exposures to those pesticides, outreach to impacted communities, and really much more. And I got my PhD in environmental engineering from Carnegie Mellon. And after that, I did a postdoc at the Colorado School of Mines. And my research interests actually were originally all water related. And um, when I joined DPR, I worked with the Surface Water Protection Program. And I joined DPR because I thought it would be a really good mix of science, research, and policy. And I realized that working with the California EPA was a really great way to accomplish that. And I moved to our AIR program, even though water related um, issues were my original research interest when the supervisor position came open because I also wanted to get involved in, like, in mentoring young scientists. And 
it's a really great opportunity because I get to work even more within that, the policy realm of the work that we do. And I'd just like to know, yeah, I saw a, a, an opportunity and I took advantage of it just despite not being directly related to the work that I had previously worked on because I knew it would help me grow, grow and also accomplish some of my other goals with mentoring young scientists and getting more into policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our next question is again, we'll ask the same question to all of you. And what do you think? What is the most important element of state and federal job applications? So who wants to start? <laughs> well, I can I can take a crack at it. And I would say um, I'll answer this from two different perspectives. So um, when you're applying to, I'll speak to federal jobs. Um, when you're applying to federal jobs, um, there is a fairly structured process um, that your resumes go through. And so for that, that first, um, the first piece of the process is getting through the HR screening. Um, and in that case, it's really important to ensure that everything you have is complete and that you your resume speaks to the position um, because it's gonna be screened by a non-expert and there are some, um, some steps that are automated. And so some federal applications will have um, a series of questions. Um, it's important that you give yourself credit for, you know, for your experience that you have. A lot of people will, will underrate themselves in those questions. Um, so, so make sure that, that you, you know, think through that automated screening portion first. And then the second piece in terms of most important, it's really most important to um, show how your experience fits the position, just like any job. So once it gets to the hiring manager, um, I'm not looking at, I'm not looking necessarily at scores coming in. I'm looking at, is this person's experience you know, what the current needs are for the position. And that should all be articulated in the announcement. I can follow up on the federal side as well. I completely agree. And I think it's important to you with that screening to realize that even if you haven't used that particular piece of software or um, something that's mentioned, it's still really important to include that keyword. So if you haven't used the specific thing they've um, mentioned, you can say on your resume, mention that word and then say similar to a software you've used. So you need to be pretty creative in how you relate your technical skills. Um, you know how they're connected, but the HR screener doesn't. You really have to mention the word that's in the listing. and we're trained to make our CVs look beautiful. They do not need to look beautiful for a federal application. When I applied for private sectors, I had very slick looking resumes. My government CV is thick with words and that's what you need to do to get through the system. The other thing is to realize there are non-federal positions that work at federal facilities. So there are contractors that staff our labs, there are um, fellowship opportunities such as NRC that Teresa started with. Those are great opportunities to, to understand the different groups at an agency, to get to know people, to understand when a listing comes up on USA Jobs that you only really have a week to get your thing in there. But if you're in the atmosphere, you get, you're just aware of it more when it's getting listed. So. Um, just to be aware that there are other companies on the same campuses, there are ORISE fellowships, ORAL fellowships, these other opportunities to still work in that environment. Um, and eventually, you know, you're a little better positioned because you're more aware of what's coming. And I can go for the uh, state level. So uh, with the state of California, for I believe for most of the positions, you need to, uh, before being able to apply or before being eligible to apply, you need to pass an exam. And it's not like, uh, it's not the type of exam that 
you have to have like a calculator by yourself. It's just a, it's just a simple questionnaire that you have to fill out. And uh, basically those questions would, um, if as long as <clears throat> much as your answer is in line with the requirement of those positions, you will get the score. And it would also ask you about any certificate, license, and previous background that is related to those certain elements that that particular job, the job category would require. Then at the end, once you submit, you, you provide your answers and submit your uh, submit your your exam, you will get an, a score. You'll get a score, and if you pass that. Uh, if you pass, if you have a certain uh, number, I, I, which I believe is 70%, you will pass that exam and then you will be eligible to apply. And then once you, like I said, once you pass the exam, you can start the actual formal application process, which we, which you will submit your resume, you will answer the other relevant questions. And then that is actually the start of the process that uh, once you submit your application at the end of the advertising period, uh, HR will scan those applications, it will scan the scores and then send them to the hiring department for selection of the candidates for actual formal interview. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything that everyone has said here. Um, the same issues apply also to state jobs in terms of the more details that you put in your resume and job applications, the better. I do not make any assumptions about what you think the hiring committee should know about you. I've seen what are probably good candidates not get interviews because they did not put enough detail in their job application. So for example, if you just said, I worked in so-and-so's lab, I can't really use that. I don't know what skills you have. So if you use particular things in that lab, say what you did, make sure it's clear how long you worked there because I use a checklist to, to see, okay, they've they have four years of lab experience, so they get four points, for example. And so, yeah, the more detail, the better. So thanks. All right, thank you panelists for your introductions and that the very specific advice. I know you can't see, but we have a room full of people that are hanging on all of your words here. Um, so we're gonna turn it over to them now for questions. So if you have a question, throw your hand up and just kind of keep your hand up for a couple of minutes. We'll try to get like one person in the queue on each side. And before you ask, just mention your name, your affiliation, and then and then have at it. So yes, please. Hello, uh, my name is Tessa. I'm a PhD student at Rice University. And I was wondering um, how Superfund sites are allocated between government and private sectors. So what are your experiences working with Superfund sites? So would any of our panelists like to jump in on that question? I feel like I should because I'm at EPA, but unfortunately I don't work on super fund related work at EPA. So I don't think I could appropriately answer your question. And uh, I'm also, uh, I'm working on a cleanup program with the state level, but uh, unfortunately, I also uh, don't have the experience of working on super fund sites. All of the projects that I have now, they are funded through either a state or uh, through a viable and liable responsible party. So I'm not quite familiar with the process for super fund sites. One like good thing I think I could make a comment on now is that um, all these agencies are huge and when you come in with a PhD or a master's degree, there are very different offices that you could end up in. And so, for example, EPA has around 15,000 different employees and some focus on regulatory management. And others such as myself are in the Office of Research and Development. And so we work on more fundamental research that supports regulatory actions. And so, well, for example, I've worked at a super fund radiological site, um, taking samples and doing studies for them in my lab, but I don't have that overall program perspective. I just have that snapshot of the particular research project there. So, 
that's another thing when you're looking for jobs within the government to realize just how diverse and large each agency is um, and that you have to do some homework to find out exactly what the day-to-day -day life will be like um, in the position you're targeting. Okay, thank you. So I think we had several questions over here. You got, yep, perfect. Yeah, hi, thank you. I'm Juliana Heisinga. I'm a PhD student at Oregon State University. And my question is how um, environmental policy impacts uh, or potentially limits your ability to fully explore and implement your research um, in your field. I would say that since we're a mission-driven organization that has to tie back to making sure that pesticide pollution isn't impacting human health, that a lot of the, the research that we do really is tied back to, it's tied back to that mission. And so like, for example, I, I don't do a lot of work in producing like or unique peer review publications, but I do do a lot of work that is in support of um, a new regulation to like limit the amount of pesticide that go, that enters our ambient air. So it, it can be really exciting, but it's, it, you're, at least with my job, I'm a little, I can't do my own unique research as much as probably some of the other agencies that are here. Uh, so th that's a little bit that, that can not, that can be something that makes people less likely to come into government. Um, but it's something that appealed to me because it was, it was really, it's really cool to see like the impact of the, the work that I'm doing, the sampling that I'm doing or the modeling that we're doing as well. And I'll follow on to that. Um, so at the, at the USGS, um, we, we always talk about how we conduct science that supports policy decisions, but we don't, we don't make policy and we, we try to, you know, make sure that we're, we're providing that unbiased information consistently. Um, and like Ann said, the federal government is big <laughs> and there are many, many different ways that this works depending on what part of the organ, part of the government you're in. Um, and I, I'd also like to, um, to say, I mean, I think to your point, um, you know, it is different doing research within the federal government. Um, you're conducting research that is um, driven by congressional priorities, by administration priorities, um, by bigger picture of what's happening in the world, what's happening in the news today. Um, and so, and the research that you're conducting is, is for the American people. It's, it's not simply, these are my data I'm collecting, this is my research. You know, it really is mission driven. Um, so, so that's one of the, the big benefits, I think, of working for government is that sense of mission and purpose that, um, that the federal and state and other government communities have. Yeah, and I can give a few tangible examples um, in my work. So when something's more um, higher profile, we have additional QA requirements for that. We have more frequent audits. Um, it's given a different category. Um, so my COVID research being so relevant um, went through a lot more um, QA level audits than other research. Um, so there are areas at EPA where it triggers a different QA category. Also something that you might not think about in the university setting is that um, we have quite a few um, review steps before we even submit our articles at EPA. So that is what we were talking about, how different offices are more have more expertise in different areas. So our papers get sent to those offices, they get to review them, our um, management looks at them for policy issues, whereas researchers, we focus on the science. Um, so there's just a longer review process before we submit. And I like to say that my paper has been peer reviewed, you know, 10 times instead of just the three reviewers. It gets better with all that feedback. Um, I also think it's just good to realize that we plan out our research with our partners, which are other federal governments and locals. 
for many years in advance before it gets going. So it is quite an involved stakeholder process um, compared to some research. Oh, and one more thing, all of our data has to be publicly accessible. Um, so we have databases where whenever we write an article, all of the raw data um, gets posted as well. So that might not, that's just an extra step we have at EPA. Hi, my name is Phoebe Keys. I am a PhD student at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I'm wondering what skills you would suggest we develop during our PhD to be successful um, in government agencies? One can start, why don't you start on it on and or I can. I can take a crack. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think some of the things that um, that are hot right now, um, you know, we are um, short on people with with great experience managing large amounts of data. So if I were to tell you one technical skill that I would invest in um, as you're, you know, while you're in school, I would say right now, big data. Um, would be that skill. But we're also looking for, you know, we're looking for well-rounded skill sets. We're looking for folks who can, who can manage projects. We're looking for people who can communicate and communicate the, the big picture about how the, the very fine details that you're studying contribute to major priorities. Um, so, so it's also about being well-rounded. But if I had to put one skill set on the table, I would say I would say data. Okay, uh, I'll follow on. Uh, what I can say from our department, because we uh, part of our mission is to communicate with people in vulnerable communities. They are our top priority. So uh, on and off, we have to have uh, conference calls, in-person meetings with them. So uh, as uh, Teresa mentioned, if you can develop uh, a strong communication skills by attending conferences, workshops, and also trying to, I mean, and even some basic things such as Toastmasters to develop those skills, that would be very helpful and the other thing i would say is, is definite requirement in our department and also i believe in every other department is you need to have a very strong writing skills and actually in our department one of the most critical steps in the interview process is the written exercise which you will be given a topic maybe simple maybe technical and you will be given uh, so like 30 minutes, 45 minutes to write on, write about that topic. And that will be reviewed as part of the interview process. So if you, uh, if you have a strong communication and writing skills, that would help you a lot in the hiring process. I think uh, data analysis and modeling tools are really important right now, just to jump on what Teresa was saying. Um, for example, our, our program, we love R because it's open source. So that means a lot of like it's free for us and then a lot of folks use it and there's a lot of support online. Um, but experience in R, different statistical analyses and other modeling tools really help in the long run. Uh, the money is tight in both state and federal budgets. So we use uh, modeling tools to help fill in our monitoring gaps. That being said, we still do monitoring. Uh, what I look for in applicants is not a specific type of monitoring or like laboratory skills that people have. I look for the fact that they can follow important sample integrity procedures, that they can design a study, that they can um, determine important study objectives. Doesn't necessarily have to be related to pesticides in air, but that they can do those specific things. And from a big picture standpoint to work for the government, I would say um, having a sense of what it means to be a public servant and um, staying flexible in your work. Um, there's a certain patience 
involved and also um, the sense that it's not your research anymore, it's the public's research um, and that you're being funded by that. And I think that's just a very different mindset to transition from your PhD work um, that you feel so personally and strongly about that carries over to government work. But I think there is this mindset change of it being for everyone um, that really has to occur to um, be happy within the federal service. Um, and then also um, a lot of PhD work is so solitary, um, but in my particular situation, there's a lot of contract management um, and it, it's not as in academia when you have a research group. I might have four or five different research groups on my different projects that are contractors working for me. And so those soft skills are very, very important um, if you want to have multiple research projects going at once. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel Tenney. I'm a PhD candidate at University of Minnesota. Um, and kind of on that note, I'm wondering if uh, you can speak a little bit to um, workplace culture and uh, level of collaboration, uh, specifically compared with a doctoral program. Our group collaborates a lot. We work together all the time. There's there is rarely one person working on one project um and so you'll there's always going to be a partner we have like different groups we have like a, like different work groups within our program for example like a monitoring work group um a gis work group and, and related to everything related to that so um there's a lot of potential for collaboration and working with your fellow scientists and i would say it it varies um based on where you are um in your career and in the government um you know i came in as a as a nrc postdoctoral fellow um and you know in those in many cases you have to build some of those collaborations yourself um so you come in with this fantastic idea and um you may not be perfectly set up to pursue that idea when you show up. <laughs> and so that idea may morph over time as you, you know, find people to, you know, to work with closely. Um, for me, it, it took probably six months to start establishing those close relationships. And, and it was hard the first, the first few months before I figured out, you know, who's, you know, who who was ready to partner and who needed my skill set in addition to me needing that theirs, um, and so so some of it is some of it is is on you in that type of situation. Um, other places, so so when I started the um, the quality team in in energy and and minerals, um, you know we we built up that community and we built that up fast. So so I built a team of eight people who is always talking to each other every single day. Um, and sometimes you'll come into an environment like that. So it, depend, it depends where you're located and, um, and you always can spur some of that yourself. Any of our other panelists wanna answer this one? Yeah, my experience starting as a postdoc is that I was assigned a mentor. Um, and so that was really helpful to meet people. I had a project I was starting with, um, and then over time met other people across the federal family that made sense with my research area. Um, we're divided into branches and divisions and centers. And um, the one thing that I love is that in my smallest work unit, it's very discipline diverse. So instead of um, being like an academic department, it's been built to have microbiologists and um, physicists and environmental engineers and GIS specialists. And so I feel very supported in the areas that I'm not an expert in, in my immediate work group. And I really like that about my particular organization that I'm part of. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, our uh, 
my role actually requires a lot of collaboration with uh, other experts because obviously I don't have uh, all the required knowledge to make a decision about uh, any specific remedy that we would like to implement. So as I said, uh, I am in constant communication with my colleagues, even though we, uh, from the day one that I joined the department, I uh, barely had a chance to meet them in person due to COVID situation, but uh, that doesn't stop us from communication. Uh, we have daily or weekly meetings with them, depending on the project needs, and I get their feedback, and I feel really supported in, uh, when, especially the first days that I joined the, um, the department, and it was kind of like new to me. Everything was kind of new to me, and they really, they were really supportive. My supervisor was also really supportive to help me to uh, get up on speed for the projects that I was assigned to, and uh, to basically I can start moving moving the projects forward. All right, thank you for those responses. Other questions in the room? Okay, so we have one coming up over here. Anyone over here want to get in the queue and just throw your hand up? Uh, hey, what's going on? Um, I'm Andrew. I'm a postdoc at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, I was just wondering, you've sort of like answered this a little bit, but if there were particular reasons that you guys went, uh, that you chose like government work over academic work, you know, like what your experience was leaving grad school or, you know, leaving academia. Thanks. So when I was leaving academia or when I was leaving grad school, um, I was looking at both academia and at government. Um, I really liked in academia the ability to mentor students and to you know, grow the next generation of engineers and scientists. And that was really exciting to me. Um, I took a year long um, teaching, um, teaching professor job and and taught for a year um, and had to do long distance uh, long distance marriage from my husband in order to do that um, and ultimately you know I for for my life choices um, I had a little bit more flexibility when it came to working in government in terms of being able to live in a specific location so I'm out in out in Colorado um, and so I, you know, that was one of the reasons why I was looking at both of those at the same time in order to try and try and live where I wanted to live um, and ended up with uh, the postdoc opportunity and the government opportunities that followed on from that. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to be in government was that that mission focus, the sense of being um, bigger than than just yourself and just your own research um, and contributing to bigger priorities. Anyone else want to chime in on this one? Yeah. Um, uh, I actually, after gra after I graduation from, uh, from the school, I felt like that it would be more practical for me to get some experience in the industry. So I was looking when I, at the time of graduation, I was mostly looking for industry jobs. And once I got one, I took it and I started my role as a, as an engineer working for a consulting firm. Uh, I started with a small consulting firm. Then I joined a year later, I joined a bigger one and I was assigned to a project that was actually very relevant to uh, to the work that I have now because uh, I was working as a contractor for uh my current department what i can say about my motivation uh in joining the government job is actually the the government jobs are really stable and uh, most of them are really secure if there is any windfall in the economy if you are in the government you will i mean you your the impact it might have on you would be minimal uh, but when you are in the industry, especially in the consulting firm, it might vary depending on their needs and uh, the type of job that they have. Some projects, like in the pandemic, some some projects completely put on hold by the companies or by, by their clients because of the uh, 
resource limitations. That's not, that's not the problem in the government and most of the time. And the other thing is you know, when you are working for the consulting firm, you have to be profitable and always billable. That is not a case in the government. In the government, you need to do your job. And in my case, our major, our major goal, our core goal is to protect public health and safety and also the environment. So we are not, going, we are not working to make money. But in a consulting firm, their final goal is to make money. So I, although they are, they want to do their job in the in the, as in the best way as they can, but it's, I mean the final goal is to be profitable. That is the goal of all the uh, upper managers and executives, and you will be in line with that goal. But in the government, uh, our goal. I mean, what I can say is the goal is not to make money. Although we are, we have a cost recovery program that would eventually get reimbursed by a responsible party. So I would like to also um, just take another opportunity to plug some of the postdoc programs um, in the federal government. And you know, those of you who may be thinking about, you know, what do I do next? And you know, do I want to go academia? Do I want to go government? Those are fantastic opportunities to see what it's like to work for the federal government. Um, a lot of the time, they'll have more flexibility. Um, because they are growth and development programs um, than you know your your typical government jobs that are advertised on on USA jobs. Um, and so so there's the National Research Council program and mentioned the ORISE fellowships. Um, at USGS, we have a program called the Mendenhall program. And in many of these cases, you'll work with a research advisor at the agency to, understand the landscape and craft a proposal that meets the agency's needs, but also has your background and interests incorporated into it. Um, and then it gives you, you know, a year or two or three year window to test out that environment, to get some additional publications under your belt. And, you know, I, I know of many people who have gone through that and decided, no, academia is really, for me, it's the way I want to go. It, it helps you put together your faculty package. Um, and then some of them have, you know, like me, have found that, okay, government is a good fit. Um, and it helps you decide where you want to land. Okay, great. We have other questions in the room. So we'll come here first. And then I think we got someone over here too, right? So we'll go to you first. Uh, hi, this is uh, Matham. I'm from Howard University. Uh, my question is, um, we know that a big part of uh, enhancing your chance of getting a job is building connections with the people who hire you. So from your experience, if you build those connections, uh, how did you build them? Or like, what's your advice on building those connections? Thank you. One piece of advice I have is sometimes there's a technical contact listed on a posting and I always recommend you reach out to that person as soon as possible and just try to learn about the position that you're applying to. Um, oftentimes it's someone like me listed, not just the HR specialist, and I'll have that conversation with you about my work. Um, which I'll tell the same thing to every applicant, but you'll be able to tell if it's a good fit for you and be excited and your enthusiasm will carry through. Um, I do think that the postdoc programs and the fellowship programs are the um, most um, advantageous way to network in the government. Um, I do think the government is a little less about who you know. I do think that it is a more even playing field. For example, our interviews are all the same questions for every single applicant um, and we won't go off script. Um, so I do think that's a little bit of a relief to that like networking pressure, but um, I do think where networking can help you is to really understand the, um, the job functions of that particular application. And I think that can make you really good when you interview. So 
um, since I work for the state of California, it's really hard for me to travel out of state for conferences and meetings. However, I am able to participate in local and regional conferences and meetings. So therefore it's, it, I can really talk to people at like a local or regional um, like chapter meeting of some type of organization such as this one. And that's a really good way to meet people in the government because it's a lot easier for them to travel to it. It's a lot easier to get those types of approvals. And so, and they're usually cheaper for your PI to send you to as well. So I, I definitely recommend trying to go to some of these smaller local chapter meetings or conferences to, to do that networking. One more say. Doug, we have one more question too. Hi, uh, my name is Shatula. I am a PhD candidate at Michigan State University. So I had a question about the application process. So do you really look at publications while hiring in terms of looking at the application of the candidate? And also is hiring limited or restricted to US citizens or permanent residents? So I'm going to use the, it depends <laughs> again. Um, you know, I hire for, um, for a pretty broad range of, of different job opportunities. And in some cases, publication record doesn't matter at all. Um, and, you know, if someone may have no publications on their, on their resume and they be, may be the most qualified applicant. Um, for research positions, um, publications are important in my experience, although they tend to be less important than when you're applying for academic um, positions, at least in, in my experience. Um, and, and I would say, you know, most of the hiring that I currently do is, um, is for permanent federal positions. And so there I am limited to US citizens applying for those positions, um, which is one of the, the limitations of being in federal government. So at EPA, um, some of the postdoc opportunities are open to green card holders. Um, the federal postdocs, the fellowships are open to um, those are the ORISE ones that I mentioned are open to non-US citizens. Full-time permanent employment is just US citizens only. Um, I am a situation where I had only submitted my publications when I was starting my postdoc um, and they weren't accepted yet at journals and uh, my group had no problem with that. Um, one thing in my organization is we do have a process akin to tenure. It's not quite the same. It's called the TQB. Um, there's no time limit of when you need to do it, but publications are factored into that in addition to your support for stakeholders and your broader impacts as well. Um, so if you are in a research arm of EPA, it's not the same for other offices. Your publications do matter in that regard, but um, my experience when I was getting hired into my group is there wasn't the pressure to have them already accepted. It was more that they could see some of your work um, and what skill set you had. So in terms of state government, this is actually one of the most difficult aspects of my job for, um, for like citizenship type stuff. So um, you don't necessarily have to be a citizen or um, but my department specifically doesn't do E-Verify. However, there are other departments and agencies within the state of California that does do E-Verify. So I think if you're interested in a particular state agency or department, just to reach out to the hiring supervisor to check, because they're happy to like walk you through all of those like questions and issues related to that. And in terms of publications, it's I look more for writing skills. And I think like doing like being first author on a paper 
or contributing to a publication really can showcase your writing skills and also showcase that, that you can collaborate on a big project. So I definitely think that goes a long way in giving you a leg up in the hiring process. And I just want to add that with the engineering roles, um, either when I was in the consulting firm uh, or in the uh, government role, uh, they never asked me to submit my published articles. But the thing I can say is, for example, in the government, uh, if you have higher education, for example, if you have a bachelor degree, if you have a master degree, or if you have a PhD, well, if you have the qualifications and uh, and if they hire you, then they put you in, if you have PhD, they put you in uh, higher levels. They, I mean, you won't start with the entry level. They put you in uh, higher levels depending on your education. So that is the place that uh, your advanced degree would play a role. And with regard to immigration, I am actually permanent resident. And as far as I know, the state of California doesn't have any uh, U.S. citizenship requirement, but I'm not sure if you are like, uh, if they support any uh, H-1B visa for international students, that would be the question for any particular department and the representative HR. Okay, with that, we are closing our session. Thanks for all the panelists uh, who answer all of our questions. Thank you.